Hey, good day to everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Nguai Chung. I'm the Early Retirement Masterclass Trainer for Dr. Wealth. And for today, I'm going to run through a series of investment myths. All right, the Dr. Wealth uh, staff wants me to go through these myths uh, randomly strewn uh, in this cup over here. And uh, I will discuss whether I agree or disagree with these points. Okay, so uh, let's move very quickly. All right, the first myth is Investing is meant for the rich, okay? Um, I disagree with this myth. I think that uh, we, we all have to start somewhere. And uh, in my own personal investing journey, when I started out on my investing, uh, my investing career, I was 25 years old. And when I got my second paycheck, when I got my second paycheck, I was actually in debt. I have about $22,000 owed to my father's CPF account, right? When I graduated from the School of Engineering in NUS. So uh, even when I owed my dad some money, uh, I was able to put aside a certain amount of my income. Uh, and I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, in those days, we didn't really have uh, exchange traded funds. I put in about $300 in a regular savings plan. Uh, into a global equity unit trust. And of course, uh, many, many years later, I began to regret doing that uh, because of the amount of uh, expenses that I paid uh, to the fund manager. Okay, But uh, please don't wait for you to get rich uh, before you start investing because if you do not invest, uh, you might never become rich in the first place. Okay, first piece, done. Next. Higher rewards require higher risk, okay? Now, I can't really agree with this statement because uh, at least from our point of view for the students of my program, we always believe that uh, rewards are moderated by the kind of risk that you have. So, how do you compare the difference between for example, a cryptocurrency like Dogecoin that could double its value within a couple of days against something like your CPF ordinary account, right? Uh, the best way to actually compare these two investments, uh, it's simply not to separate return and risk into different silos. You should, in fact, try to combine them together. And uh, in such a case, my program likes to use this thing known as a Sortino Ratio, which is the return of a particular investment minus the risk-free rate divided by the downside risk of a particular investment. And so when you use that, you're using a safer number to assess your risk against each other. And uh, you will find in many cases that the higher returns that, for example, what cryptocurrency would give to you, uh, would disappear very rapidly if you divide it all right, by the standard deviation, the semi-deviation or the downside risk of a particular uh, investment. All right? So always remember that uh, we are here to adjust your returns based on the risk that you're taking. Okay? And when you do this, all right, higher rewards uh, may not actually require higher risk. All right? okay, I hope that answers the question. Okay, let's uh, look at the next myth. Accumulating stocks on every dip, okay? Is accumulating stocks on every dip a very good idea? Okay, now once again, that depends. Now, there are various growth investing ideas that are momentum driven, which means that these stocks go higher when historically it has gone higher, right? In such a case, you might be better off accumulating the stocks when it has recently rebounded and is going higher, right? Now, there are other investments like real estate investment trusts as well as dividend stocks that have a mean reverting kind of tendency and these stocks have a tendency to go higher only after a period of underperformance all right so there's more reversion to the uh, mean and in such a case yes you definitely are better off accumulating stocks on every day all right so the program which i do the early retirement masterclass we specialize in these very forgiving kind of stocks and that it is actually very profitable to invest in these stocks on a downturn because they have this ability to bounce back. All right, so accumulating stocks on a downturn works uh, for at least the students of my program. But if you're looking at cryptocurrencies and a lot of growth counters that are momentum driven, actually the opposite might be true. You might be better off accumulating these stocks uh, when they have gone higher. 
Okay. All right. Myth number four. Uh. You must know how to time the market. All right. Um, the truth is that if you're gonna make timing the market uh, a prerequisite to investing, many people would not have invested in the first place. Uh, timing the market is a very difficult enterprise. It requires an understanding of market cycles. And if you want to analyze market cycles, uh, it can be a full-time career. Uh, one of the things I learned uh, reading this book on business cycles uh, is that there are actually three parts to a market cycle. There is a high frequency component uh, based on the inventory of factories. Um, there is a mid frequency component uh, based on I think the capital expenditure of these companies and there is a very long uh, duration, very, uh, very low frequency component based on property cycles and your market cycle is basically a combination of these three cycles operating at the same time. Okay, now uh, I will tell you that it's not within my pay grade to, to actually figure out these market cycles myself. Uh, it's very often done uh, by using intuition and uh, I, I think that it would seriously take a very long time to understand the market cycles. It's something that we're constantly grappling with. So uh, don't wait all right, to be able to understand these things before you time the market. Uh, generally speaking, if the price to earnings ratio of a particular market you're looking at is around less than 20, right? I think it's okay to uh, put in a small little equity position in the markets. All right. Next bit. Past performance guarantee future returns. Okay, that's certainly not true. Uh, I've done a video, in fact, I've done a video about 30 minutes ago and uh, we were investigating the worst performing uh, portfolio for our ERM students. So the students of batch 7, which occurred in September 2001, uh, 2019, uh, we found that um, there is no past performance guarantee. The students basically built a trap for themselves uh, when they uh, selected the highest dividend uh, factor uh, for real estate investment trust. And that has worked very well in the past, right? For one or two years in the past. But unfortunately for this special batch of students, uh, the factor began to fail in the future. And so they uh, began to outperform the rest of the market. All right, so that's a very, very humbling experience. And you can probably learn more by looking at that video uh, that probably would have been produced by now. Okay, uh, so uh, we don't think that past performance guarantees future returns. It is a very good telling indicator that for maybe for the next one year, there will be a slight outperformance. Uh, but unfortunately, like many things in life, it is not guaranteed. Okay. All right. I do not know how many myths I've covered so far. There are nine in total. Um, safe investments are the best bet. Uh, I don't agree with this statement because the safest investment that we have in Singapore right now are the Singapore savings bonds. All right, you can get them if you have a CDP account and you can assess an ATM. The safest investment would give you, I think, between 0.3 to 0.5% a year. Okay, that, that is the safest investment guaranteed by the Singapore government. Now, had you been investing in these Singapore savings bonds, then you would be in a little bit of trouble because if you look at our inflation numbers, it's going up to uh, perhaps higher than 1%. And so uh, your Singapore savings bonds the coupons that you receive from these bonds uh, would not be able to offset your increase in fuel prices. Uh, so uh, basically the safe investments investments can be a trap. Uh, and if you do not, and if you're not really willing to take on a little bit of risk in the equity markets, right, uh, you can really become poorer every year thanks to inflation. Alright, so this statement is definitely not true. Okay, investing is a time-consuming activity. Okay, uh, all right. Now, the truth is that being an investment trainer is a time-consuming activity, all right? It takes a certain number of weeks as I uh, prepare for my slides and uh, every, every training that I conduct is different, right? The slides have to change, all right? Now, investment itself, uh, I would say is not time-consuming because if you actually use a very conservative yield-based, value-based kind of portfolio, you only need to monitor it for about a year, okay? And you don't have to look at the markets. You can focus on your day job, all right? So I don't think it is a time-consuming activity. But if you take a different tack and you position yourself as a trader, that can be very time-consuming because 
your market moves, uh, hourly changes to prices is going to affect a large amount of the time. All right. So uh, per se, I would say that investing is not a time-consuming activity. All right. You probably don't have to spend more than five minutes just looking at your portfolio every day. All right. Okay. Uh, I see two more slips uh, in the cup. So uh, this is the second last question. Okay. Uh, investing in stocks is the only option. Well, that's certainly not true. Uh, there are uh, many asset classes that uh, you can invest in. Stocks just happen to give a decent return of about 8 to 9% on average uh, before inflation, uh, and it has a decent standard deviation, about 17 to 20%. All right? uh, there are other options out there. There are bonds that can give you 3% returns with a much lower downside risk. Uh, there is, of course, cryptocurrency uh, for people who are looking at the future. All right? So, um, Investing in stocks is definitely not the only option. Okay, that's that's actually quite easy to answer. And the last question is, uh, stock market is too volatile. All right. Now, the stock market is designed to be volatile. Okay, but there are ways to cherry pick a certain number of stocks within a universe of stocks to reduce the amount of volatilities. Right. Uh, one example of doing that. Uh, and it's a, it's a very traditional method of doing that, is to look for stocks that give a very high dividend yield. So if you take a universe of stocks that uh, give a higher dividend yield compared to the rest in the, in, to, to the markets, you're likely to be able to reduce your volatility by uh, one to two percentage points. Uh, and that's largely what my students are trained to do. Uh, we look for a series of factors that would reduce the amount of volatility so that uh, not only would you have higher returns, you'll be able to uh, sleep very well at night. Okay, and uh, that's it uh, for the amount, uh, for the uh, myths that I have to deal with. Uh, I, I hope you've had a, a productive time listening uh, to this presentation. Uh, thank you very much.